All right, someone uh, help me out. Were we on number four? Five. We finished four. We're now on five? I do believe we did finish four. Perfect. Four was the square root one, right? Yep. Perfect. Okay, let's go ahead on five. Did we start it? No. No, let's plot some points. Ready for the weekend, Mrs. Bowers? You betcha. Anything exciting planned? Homework. Homework. Speaking of homework, you guys know that summer assignment I gave you? <laughs> yeah? The day we come back from Labor Day, week, La Labor Day weekend, okay? I'm giving you another week if you need it. Okay? You can kiss my feet if you want to. <laughs> no. Thank you. I, I know you guys have been working pretty hard on it. I've been getting emails and people coming in as asking questions, which has been wonderful, okay? How's it going to be graded? I'm going to grade two questions from each chapter for correctness, and then the rest of it's completion. Yay. Okay? Sound good? The day we get back, the day we get back, so Tuesday, September 3rd, 4th, 4th. Okay. I'm going to give you another week. All right. If we were to co connect the dots, can we anticipate what type of function or graph this is? Exponential. Exponential, good. Exponential. So we kind of have this very level, flat portion, and then it kind of grows very quickly. Perfect. All right, so characteristics. You can look at some of the ones we were doing yesterday to help you out. Let's jot some things down either about this particular graph or just exponentials in general. There's a horizontal asymptote. There is a horizontal asymptote. I, or I abbreviate those HA, horizontal asymptote. Um, where is this particular horizontal asymptote located? Three. Say it again. Three. Three. Horizontal asymptote at the y value of three. So if you were to kind of show that idea, you, typically we use a dotted line to show that horizontal asymptote. Notice though how this horizontal asymptote really only applies to the left hand side of the graph. Okay, not necessarily the right. So you could have uh, different asymptotes at different locations, one on the left side, one on the right. Okay. Um, what else about exponentials? Anything. Good, Josh, or not Josh. Joseph, sorry. Various slopes. slopes. How'd you know that? It's curved. Anything else? We want to hit up the equation, the domain or range. Isn't the equation? Uh -huh. I think. K, well, it will be KX equals, uh -huh. and I want to be like A with a, a to the power of X plus something. Plus, okay. Oh, so, AB. I knew there was AB. Okay, so the, we've been talking about different equations of, of functions. We know lines, we have the MX plus B form, we have the point slope form, the standard form. For um, quadratics, we have that standard form with the ax squared plus bx plus c. For exponentials, they typically have this form to them where we may have a multiplier out front. Okay, it could be one though, so you might not see it. But the big idea is that in an exponential, you always have a number to the power of x. It's called an exponential because the x, the variable's in the exponent spot. And sometimes you might be adding a number on the end as well. So we're going to try to figure out what this is. Sometimes exponentials, figuring out the equation um, by hand or in your head can be tricky. So if we need to rely on a calculator for this one, I'm completely okay with that. What's neat though about this general form is the c value 
is the location of your horizontal asymptote. You know whatever you add on the end of an equation that's shifting it either up or down, right? Okay. On a typical exponential function, the horizontal asymptote is on the x-axis. But notice how this one's at 3. So it was shifted up 3. Okay, we would have a plus 3 on the end. So maybe we can anticipate that. Now, what's a little tricky is we got to think about what number could we raise to the power of x and then add 3 to it in this case. And that would give us our y value. So for instance, what number could you raise to the power of 2 and then add 3 and then you would get your answer of 7? What number could you raise to the power of 4, add 3, and then you would get 19? We're trying to figure out what's that b value or base. What's that one number? What do you think, Joseph? 2. two. Let's try it. Okay, so 2 squared, that's our x value if we look at this point, would be 4. Add 3, we get 7. 2 to the 0 power, what's 2 to the 0 power? 1. 1 plus 3 gives us 4. So notice how that's working out. Okay, so if that's the case, we don't really have an a value in, in this example. I mean, the a value would be 1, but we don't have to write it if you don't want to. Okay? But that can be a little tricky because it's a lot of like plugging and chugging and guessing and checking, see what's going to happen. How might we use our calculator to find the equation of this exponential? Remember, we have a table of values. Say it again. Recursion. Regression. Uh, regression. regression. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Something else. Yes. Okay. Recursion is like over and over and over again. Okay. Let's try regression. Do you remember the ca the button calculators to press? to type in our table. Let's try it, okay? Um, we're going to hit, let me zoom out a bit here. All right, we're going to hit the stat button. By the way, if you need to get a calculator, go ahead. They're on the door over there. Okay. We're going to hit the stat button. Because essentially we're dealing with statistics. We're dealing with data. We have a data table, table of values. So we're going to hit the stat button and we're immediately going to hit enter. Notice how the cursor is on the edit option. Now you should have an L1 and an L2 column popping up. Does anyone have something different? I might have to change the setting on your calculator. Okay. If you have numbers in there, we want to clear them out because we want to type in the ones that we have. So in order to clear out those numbers, you have to arrow to the very top where it says L1 and L2 and hit clear. And if you arrow back down, it will get rid of all of those numbers in the column. So you can use the arrow keys to kind of move around and clear out those numbers. So we're going to treat L1 like the X's and L2 like the Y's. Let's go ahead and type in the data from the table. Can we get all those numbers in? Okay, so right now, once you're done typing in the numbers, they are stored on your calculator. We don't have to worry about saving them or anything like that. They're already stored. To get the equation, we're going to go back to the stat button. But instead of hitting enter, like we did before to type in the numbers, we're going to go over to the calculate menu. And this is where you have all of your different regression options. You have LIN-REG, which stands for linear regression. Maybe you wanted a line. 
you have quad reg, which is quadratic regression. Maybe you wanted a parabola, but we want exponential in this case. So I think if you scroll down a bit, that's option zero. Okay, so we're gonna select option zero. There may be a menu like this that pops up. That's completely okay. Just keep hitting enter once you get down to calculate. All right, so it looks like in this case, our calculator is giving us a different equation. All right, do we have those numbers 7.87 and 1.443? Okay, so what's a little bit different on your calculator is your calculator only has this standard form exponential equation as an option, okay? It will never ever have this plus C on the end, okay? So we do have some ways to figuring out the exponential form. If you wanted to do it by hand, okay, notice how those numbers are a little bit easier, but if you do have a calculator and you're able to use it, this would also be another option. I bet if you were to plug in the x values from the table in here, it would be the numbers that we get as the y values, if not extremely close, okay? So we do have two ways to get the equation. Anything else about exponentials we might know? Either about this one or in general? Domain range. Let's tackle domain and range, okay. Domain, range, how far left and right does this exponential go? Domain is all real numbers. All real numbers, forever to the left, forever to the right. What about the range? Low to high? Three, with infinite parentheses. Okay. To infinity. To infinity, all right. So we have no brackets in this case because you will never ever touch three. Okay, we have that asymptote there. But again, you'll never ever touch infinity because it's just going to go on forever. Okay? Um, there are two other things about exponentials that I want to discuss. We have two different ways of classifying exponentials. Remember what those titles might be? Stevie? Growth and decay. Growth and decay. Yep. All right, so how can we tell if an exponential fo function or graph is growth or decay? Maybe we can talk about it graphically. Maybe we can talk about the equation. How can we determine the difference? Go ahead, uh, Ariana. Um, so usually you read a graph left to right. So yep. So the way from the asymptote, it's a growth and growth towards it, and it's a decay. Okay, so a way from asymptote that's classified as exponential growth and towards asymptote is classified as exponential decay. Now I just want to draw an example here. Um, let's say this graph was kind of flipped if we put in a negative, we flipped it, and it looked like this. Is that growth or decay, that green one? As you read from left to right, is your graph going away from the asymptote or towards the asymptote? That'd be growth, but in the negative. It's a growth in the negative direction, okay? So just because it goes down, that doesn't mean it's decay you're just growing in a negative direction, okay? Towards the asymptote would look something like that. Can we see that? Yeah, you see how as we read from left to right, it goes towards the asymptote, okay? So it depends graphically kind of um, in relation to the asymptote what's happening, all right? Anything else about exponentials? I'm good if you are. Okay, let's go ahead and check out six.
go ahead and plot some points. What do we think about this one? Looks to be exponential again. It's exponential again, right? Notice how it's kind of growing very quickly downward. But if we were able to plot some of these other negative points, it, it would kind of level out. So this is another exponential. It's just a little different. So all of the properties and things that we did for the last one apply to this one. Maybe we have a different domain and range, okay, but it's still exponential growth, decay, that whole idea applies here. Where's our horizontal asymptote in this guy? Two. Okay, so if we were to try to figure out an equation for m of x, we know we would need a plus two on the end, okay? But the other pieces are a little tricky to figure out. Do we want to try to figure out by hand or do we want to use regression again on our calculator? Do we have a preference? see people using calculators, so I guess that's telling me my answer, right? Yeah? Okay. So go ahead and type in that data. Remember, hit the stat button. Any takers? Three decimal places if we need a round? I got negative six on the outside. Exactly? Yeah. Negative six, okay. Two on the inside and a plus two. I did it by hand. Oh, you did it by hand. Okay. We'll, we'll check that one out. Let me write that up here. I think that's accurate. We'll check that out. What about regression people? You got error? Yeah, me too. Oh, we all got error?
Does it come up domain? Yeah. Hmm. All right. I'll have to look into that. Maybe it can't be done without the uh, A, B, and the plus. Possibly. I'll look into it, okay? I'll put question mark there for now. Okay, well, we'll I'll look into that and get back to you guys. I thought it would work. Or at least it should have. Let's go ahead and check out uh, Dan's, though. We'll, we'll test some of our points. If we were to plug in 0 for x, we should get negative 6 as our answer. So 2 to the 0 is... All right, okay. If we kept it the way it is, 2 to the 0 would be 1. 1 times negative 6 is negative 6. Plus 2 is negative 4, right? But we need it to be a negative 6. So this 6 is off by 2 so units. The other, yes. There we go. So now that would work. Let's maybe see if we plug in 2. 2 squared is 4 times negative 8. We got negative 32 plus 2, negative 30. Works out? Okay. So I'll check out the regression, but again, it might be a little guessing and checking to get the other form. All right. Uh, exponential growth or decay for this guy? Growth. As you move left to right, you're going away from the asymptote. Perfect. What about domain and range for this one? The range is at a minimum negative infinity with parentheses and mm -hmm. to a possible of two parentheses. Two parentheses, all right. Negative infinity to two. Domain, if we go left to right. All real numbers. All real numbers. And it's negative. Negative growth, yep, because we're going down. Perfect. Anything else? All right. Let's check out our last one. We're going to end on a good note. Try to plot these. Try. I don't know about you, but there's only three on there that I can actually plot, right? Okay. But that doesn't mean the rest of the information is irrelevant. Okay, we're going to use that to help us kind of sketch the rest of this graph. Um, let's go ahead and talk about, because I think this is the second time we've seen this undefined word pop up in a table. What might be happening graphically if an x value is undefined? It could be a hole. What else could be happening graphically? Graphic Anastasia? Hold on. Oh, Asymptote. And what was the third one, Daniel? Dan? Graph could just not go that. No graph. Maybe the graph just doesn't go that far. Okay? So whenever something's undefined, one of those three is going to happen. So we got to try to determine what is going on at negative three and what the heck is going on at one. Can we perhaps take a guess. Negative three well, is a hole. Go ahead, um, Ariana. It's a hole. Why? Because if you look at the values next to it for y, uh -huh. they're very close together, so it's not going to be an asymptote. It's just going to be a little missing hole. A missing chunk, right? Asymptotes, typically, you have the very drastic up and down motion, right? However, we don't have that here. Notice how the point before negative 3 and after negative 3 are practically the same value. So if they're really close to each other on each side, but at negative 3 there's nothing there, you have that chunk missing. So that's creating a hole at negative 3. What perhaps is happening at 1? Go ahead, Ariana. Um, it's going to be an asymptote because the left is very high and the right is very low and the Wonderful. Okay, so notice how on the left-hand side, very close to 1, yet we have a very, very high y value or height. So this side of the graph is going up positively. 
the right side of one is going down extremely negatively. So we have an asymptote at one. Perfect. Um, let's see. So maybe if we try to connect these ideas, this side, we go through the one point we were able to graph and we'll connect it to that hole. Can we perhaps use some of the table values on this left-hand side to figure out what the rest of this left-handed graph looks like? What was that, Ryan? It doesn't cross negative two. It's not going to cross negative two. Notice how you have a very, very negative x value. Like you're somewhere all the way up here. We're going to be very, very close to negative two. So looks like we have a horizontal asymptote at that spot. Notice it also, right, on the right side, we're not going to go past negative 2 either because we're going to level out. So this right-handed piece, I guess we're going to go up, but we don't go past that negative 2. We're doing okay? All right. So do we remember what this type of graph is called, where we have these asymptote looking shapes. This one's a little hard. I'll give you that. What are you thinking? Rational. Yep. Rational. So let's tackle a few things. Maybe we can try to find the domain, the range, Maybe we'll try the equation. We'll give a stab at it. Anybody want to tackle domain or range? How far left can we go? How far right can we go? But do we have any issues in between? Okay. All real numbers, but x cannot equal, what were those again? X can't equal 1. 1. And y can't equal negative 2. All right, if we're, talking about a y, if we're talking about a y value, that would be a range, so we'll get there in a second. Is there another x value that we can't be? Is there another x value that is undefined or doesn't have a point there? Negative 3. Perfect. Okay, so domain is just x's, how far to left and right. Perfect. So you could state it, all real numbers, but x can't be 1 or negative 3. Um, did anyone use interval notation, like with infinities? Okay, Ariana, did you have your hand? Maybe? <laughs> okay. Let's see, negative infinity to negative 3. Um, I know last year with my kids I used a U. Does that look familiar? Okay, th that means union. You're like merging all of these intervals together. Okay, so negative infinity to negative 3, negative 3 to 1, 1 to infinity. That's, that's another way to represent the idea that Ryan just said. You can be every number you want. You can go from negative infinity to positive infinity, but you're skipping over negative 3 and 1. And we're skipping over it because we have those parentheses there. You're not touching that point. All right. What about the range? So Ryan said all real numbers, but y cannot equal negative 2. Is there another y value that we can't be? Okay, so notice how if you look at your y's right here, okay, we know we can't be negative 2 because that's where the horizontal asymptote is. 
but this hole is presenting another y location that we don't have because we go from negative 1.25 to negative 1.249, okay? We're not quite sure what's in there, so maybe we'll say negative 1.25 actually what's in between yeah what do you want to try to say uh, you could put a bracket negative 1.250 comma negative 1.249 because that signifies that anything in between that cannot be while still including those two you numbers. could definitely do that let's go ahead and we'll say 0.2499 that's definitely in between those two okay or you could again use the interval notation going from negative infinity to positive infinity. Just instead of negative three and one, we would have these values. Okay? All right, let's try to tackle the equation. What does a rational equation look like or what does it involve? Go, ahead, Daniel. Uh, the rational equation involves factors being over factors or quadratics being over quadratics or okay. whatever you want. I did both forms. Okay, so we're going to have factors, a.k.a. parentheses groups, and a rational function is always a fraction of some type. So we're going to have some things up top and some things on the bottom. The question is, how can we determine what these factors look like? And this is all going to come back to the fact that we know we have a hole somewhere and we have an asymptote somewhere. What do you think, Dan? Uh, with the whole, that means that the two factors are in both the denominator and the numerator. Okay. So we can put x plus 3 as that is. Okay. okay, so the fact that we have a whole at negative 3 means that we have factors of x plus 3 on top and bottom. How did you know they had to be on top and bottom? Because whenever they cancel out, that stops it from being an asymptote, but still makes it a whole. That's, ma that's what's making it a whole. Okay, so the fact that if you had the same thing up top and bottom of a fraction, wouldn't that cancel each other out? And if you're canceling it out, you're making it a whole. It's like you're removing it from the problem. What's up? Where are you going to be? So how can you bring it back when you're done? Okay. So the fact that we have a hole there, we know x plus 3 has to be on top and the bottom because we are removing it. It would cancel out. That's what's creating the hole. Um, what else? Good, Dan? Uh, we know for a fact that x minus 1 is only in the bottom as that is a vertical asymptote. That's an asymptote. Okay, so these factors have to be in the bottom because notice how if we were to plug in negative 3, that would make the first factor 0. And if we were to plug in 1, that would make the second factor 0. We would have 0 in the bottom of a fraction, and hopefully we know that's a no-no, right? So wherever you have a hole or an asymptote, those related factors are always going to be in the bottom. It's just when you have a hole that the factor is going to be up top as well because it has to cancel out. What's up? Uh, consider as, well, for rational equations, there are three types of horizontal asymptotes you can have. You can have a slant if I forget what the parameters are, but okay. that's not one of those. That's okay. This is the one that isn't zero, which is when uh, both the leading exponent in the top and bottom standard equation are equal. So that means that we have to have one more factor in the top. Okay. And as we know, the factors in the top are zeros if they aren't canceled out by denominators. So the horizontal asymptote being at negative two, you would take the leading coefficient of the top and the bottom and divide them out. So we know that it has to be negative two x because we don't have any other leading coefficient along the bottom. Did you guys follow that at all? No. <laughs> okay. Um, he's correct, but what he said is what we're going to talk about in our first chapter. Okay, so we're, we're going to get there. Um, to summarize, what he's saying is there should be another factor up here. Okay, we only get the bottom factors based off of the whole or an asymptote. Okay, however, we don't really know if there should be. Well, I know, and Dan figured out that there should be another one. But for now, okay, we're just going to put a question mark. Is there another factor up there? We're going to explore that more in our first chapter. Okay? But are we okay with where these three other factors came from? Those are the big ones. The whole and an asymptote. Okay? Perfect. 
All right, everyone's favorite yeah, yeah, unit circle. Let's go ahead and try to fill out this bad boy. All right, so um, there are certain pieces that I've crossed out. Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, there are certain pieces I crossed out. Those were all the degree locations. Um, the reason I crossed them out is because we are no longer working in degrees this year. It's all radians. Remember those pies? Okay. No degrees, all radians. So we're going to fill this out um, using radians. Where do we want to start? Do we want to start filling in the point values? Do we want to start filling in the radian values? What do you guys feel comfortable with or where's a good starting point? Do we maybe remember any of these coordinates on our unit circle or at least some special ones? Say it again, Ryan. Isn't the middle one uh, square root of 2 over 2? This one, yeah. Okay. Square root of 2 over 2. Yes, that is 45 degrees. And it's square root of 2 over 2 for both of them. But we're going to figure out what the 45 degree is. And it's a radian. Good, Dan? Uh, this is not the radian, but like all of like the little points are like going clock, going counterclockwise from the first one. That'd be 1, 0, and 0, 1, and negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. Okay, so if this is a unit circle, we're only going one unit out. So if you think about a coordinate system, if this is your origin and you go to the right one unit, wouldn't one comma zero be the ordered pair, like the x and y value? Okay, so the easiest points, in my opinion, are the right and left points and the top and bottom points, because you're just going straight out one unit or straight up and down one unit. So this would be zero, one, negative one, zero, zero, negative one. It's all the other points that are a little strange, um, but I have a way or kind of a shortcut pattern way to fill out the rest of it. Not sure if you guys remember that from, from last year or not, um, but technically, realistically, you only have to be familiar with the first quadrant and you can use those patterns to help you figure out the rest of them. What do you think, Dan? Uh, isn't two square roots of three over two one of the little factors? Um, that's when you get into the reciprocal trig functions, like secant and cosecant and cotangent. Okay, so that's, that's not one of them. One of the coordinates. Of yep, them. not one of them here. I know one half is though. Yeah, one half. One half? Okay, where's one half? Uh, it is on the rightmost bracket on the bottom one. Right, right here. Leftmost bracket on the top. One. So yeah, right there. Right okay, there. I'm using the lines on the paper as a as a fraction bar. Okay. Do you remember the other? Square. Well, that was the 45 degree, right? Square. Uh, square to three over two. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, how I remember this? If can we easily get the right point and the top point? Yeah. Can we get those? Okay. Yes. So, if you look at this rightmost point. Notice how the y value starts with 0. Then we can count 1, 2, 3. Do you see that? Notice how up here the x value starts with 0. So we count 1, 2, 3. Okay? And every single one of them is divided by 2. If you were to then take the square roots of all the tops, the square root would eventually go away on the ones because the square root of one is just one. But the square root of the two and the three can't go away because those aren't simplified nicely. Okay, so let's go ahead and maybe use that same pattern on this left hand side. Notice how the x value starts with zero. So we're going to count one, two, three. Our next easy point, the y value is zero. Oops that in the wrong spot. So we're going to count one, two, three. They are all over two. And if we were to take the square roots of all the tops, the ones don't really matter. But what do we have to be careful about in this case? 
negatives, right? Because we're in the second quadrant. So what should be negative in, a sec in the second quadrant? Say it again. The numerator on the left, all right, the x value. So negative, negative, negative. All right, can we kind of use that same pattern in the third quadrant? Start with zero as the y. Count one, two, three. Zero as the x. Count one, two, three. All over two. Square root of all the tops, ones don't matter. This time we're in the third quadrant, so do we have to be careful about any negatives? Good, Anastasia? They're all negative, x's and y's, yep. Okay. And fourth quadrant, start with zero, one, two, three. Start with zero, one, two, three. All over two. Square root of the tops. Fourth quadrant, what's negative? Y's. Okay. Good. We're doing okay? All right. We are actually going to stop there for today. All right, next week we're going to classify in terms of trig functions what's positive and negative in all these quadrants. And then we'll take a look at our last few examples, like how do we read this unit circle to answer some questions, okay?